welcome to the Right Take Podcast, news, ideas, and conversations at the intersection of politics and culture, a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I will be your host, Mark Tapson. Welcome back to the Right Take Podcast. I am your host, Mark Tapson. Thank you yet again for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. Well, Israel's war to eradicate Hamas, a war that I wholeheartedly support, by the way, because Hamas is not organized resistance to Israeli oppression, but it's a savage terror group, that war continues to rage, not only on the ground, but in the media and the court of public opinion, where support for Hamas runs disturbingly high. Israel has basically reached the point where it's on its own in this war, because her erstwhile ally, the United States of America, or more specifically, the Biden administration, is actually more of an ally to Hamas and to the Palestinian people, the vast majority of whom support Hamas and lust for Jewish blood. Back at home, the Democrat war to eradicate Donald Trump continues to rage as well in a blatantly politicized legal battle that's really nothing more than election interference. But it may not end well for Trump, at least legally. Even if convicted, he's still likely to win the presidency at the rate he's going. But if a court conviction doesn't stop him, the Democrats will find some other way to derail his momentum to the Oval Office. In fact, I believe they will do whatever it takes to keep him out of the White House. I don't believe there's any limit to what Democrats will do to seize or maintain power. And the war at home against the subversive cancer of DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, continues as well as conservatives push back against this identity politics infestation that threatens to shred the fabric of our free society. Today on The Right Take, I'm going to discuss all of that and more with my fascinating guest, Alan Dershowitz, certainly the best-known legal scholar in the country and a best-selling author as well, of course. I've been looking forward to having him on. And let me just say that however you feel about his opinions or his politics, you can't help but be amazed by the sharpness of his mind, the clarity of his speech, and his tireless energy at 85 years old. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this conversation. And let me say, as always, please take a moment to subscribe to The Right Take if you haven't already, so you can keep up with the conversations we are having here with important thinkers, writers, pundits, scholars, and storytellers. And if you like what you hear, a positive review would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Don't touch that dial. My guest today at the Right Take Podcast is one of the nation's preeminent legal scholars. He taught at Harvard Law School for 50 years. He's the best-selling author of too many books to count, and he has a new one out. It's been out a few months, uh, called War Against the Jews, How to End Hamas Barbarism. Alan Dershowitz, welcome to the Right Take Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for taking the time to come on. Uh, There are so many important issues so little time, so let's get right into it. You wrote and published this book within about two to three months, I think, of the barbaric October 7 attacks in Israel by the terror group Hamas. Obviously, you felt passionately about getting your message out. You wrote that the attacks and the worldwide response to the attacks changed everything and that nothing would ever be the same. Could you give us a few of the ways in which they changed everything? Sure. Uh, First, I started writing the book literally on October 7th and called my publisher and he said he could get it out within two months if I got it to him in 30 days. And I got it to him in 28 days and he published it literally in 58 days, October uh, 7th. Uh, I wrote it so quickly because I felt so strongly that Hamas's tactic uh, is being allowed to succeed. Hamas and other terrorist groups have had a tactic that has worked. Um, and, and it is you attack civilians, you kill them, you do it in the most brutal possible way. You know that the democracy you attack will have to uh, respond. And then you expect, particularly if it's Israel, that the world will condemn the response more than they condemn the actual activity itself. And then you will win. Uh, You will win in the court of public opinion. Remember, the Hamas definition of winning is not militarily. They know they can't beat Israel militarily, but they they can help separate Israel from the United States, and they've been doing that. They know they can help get um, uh, young, useful idiots who don't know the difference 
between Palestine and the Palisades or what river and what sea they you know you can get them to march, walk out of class. Um, people walked out of class on on, on uh, October 8th, even before Israel fired a single shot. Uh, what it showed is the pervasive, deep feeling anti-Zionism, anti-Israel, and anti-Semitism that exists uh, around college campuses and among the young. And uh, this was just an excuse. It was a show of Israel's weakness. It was the greatest intelligence failure in modern history on the part of uh, Israel, which had been thought to be invincible uh, in terms of intelligence. They are not. They make mistakes like any other country does. But it uh, began, for me, the greatest crisis was not October 7th. Uh, Intelligence failures occur. 9-11 occurred. Pearl Harbor occurred. For me, the reason I was so insistent on writing this book so quickly was October 8th and October 9th when we heard organizations like the National Lawyers Guild, the second largest bar association in America, a former you know, a communist front leftist anarchist group of lawyers, uh, blame the entire thing on Israel. And, and Hamas was perfectly entitled to do what they did, uh, rape, behead. Uh, etc. 33 Harvard groups on October 8th uh, blamed it all on Israel, again saying Hamas had the right to do what it did. It was the response to it that was even more dangerous because it's exactly what Hamas wanted. And uh, Hamas has figured out a way of, of winning these wars. It causes enormous number of civilian deaths by using human shields, shooting their own people sometimes, uh, by blaming Israel for rockets that came from Hamas or Islamic Jihad and failed, uh, sending out false information about how many people are killed and turning the world against uh, uh, Israel. So right now Hamas is winning this war, and if it is allowed to win this war, it will repeat what it did over and over again. President Biden was absolutely correct when he said that if Putin is allowed to win the war in Ukraine, he will move to other areas, uh, perhaps even NATO countries. Why doesn't he understand that the same thing is true about Hamas? If it's allowed to win this war against Israel, and again, its definition of winning is simply uh, Israel being hurt, which Israel has been hurt by this war, uh, continue to do it. And eventually it's coming to a theater near you, which Putin learned very painfully because it literally came to a theater uh, near Moscow. Now, this wasn't done by Hamas, but Hamas perfected the art of terrorism and its predecessors even before that, Al-Fatah, using terrorism as a way of bringing attention to a cause and as a way of hurting your enemies in ways that transcend the battlefield itself. Yes. Were you shocked by the degree of open support for and even celebration of um Hamas in the West in the wake of the October 7 attacks? Well, there are several groups, and some of them surprised me, some of them didn't. Obviously, extremists among Muslims and and radical Arabs didn't surprise me at all. They've been calling for the end of Israel. They've been celebrating every terrorist attack, pay for slay. They've been paying people to kill Jews. That didn't surprise me at all. Uh, What surprised me And it didn't surprise me that the anarchists, the people who occupy Wall Street, the people who use every excuse to try to bring down America, it didn't surprise me that there were signs, uh, you know, uh, uh, death to America uh, among these radical, non-Arab, non-Muslim, radical, hard left people. That didn't surprise me. What surprised me is the useful idiots, uh, the the, the college uh, uh, students um, and some professors. Uh, And there's one blame for that, uh, and one cause of it, and it's a DEI, a diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion bureaucracy that has cost billions of dollars and is in the process of destroying every major university in America. It's also destroying many corporations, but the corporations are at least understanding, and they're backing away uh, from, from, from DEI. Even uh, one of the leaders, uh, African-American leaders at Harvard Law School, uh, in, in, in a recent article, uh, black leaders condemned DEI, saying it's essentially a form of McCarthyism, and form of McCarthyism, except it's much more dangerous than McCarthyism, 
because McCarthyism looked backwards, was a thing of the past, whereas DEI is a thing of the future. Let's remember what DEI is. It has no interest in real diversity. All it wants is more people of a certain race. That's what diversity means to them. Just more, 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 more. Doesn't matter whether the more uh, bring diversity. In fact, they don't want diversity. They don't want African-Americans who have different views. They want African-Americans who support kind of uh, the whole DEI enterprise. So diversity is anti-diversity. Equity is the opposite of equality. Equity means you don't judge people based on merits. You don't listen to Martin Luther King's dream of a day when his children will be judged, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Everybody is judged by their ethnicity, by their um, by their sex, by their sexual preference, um, by their religion, by their race. Uh, it's the exact opposite. And in, expressly, expressly, under the DEI programs itself, expressly excludes Jews, expressly excludes Asians. So DEI is an absolute disaster. Uh, the other disaster that's part of DEI is intersectionality that divides the world into oppressors and oppressed. And Jews, of course, are the oppressors, even if they're poor, even if they're um, uh, people of color. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, you're an oppressor. If you're an Arab, you can be a billionaire uh, or a Muslim, you're oppressed. So when you divide the world into oppressor and oppressed and you declare Jews to be oppressors, that's a an obvious incubator for anti-Semitism. And then the last part of it, which is the most controversial, I have for years strongly opposed ethnic departments. I don't think there should be a black studies department in any university. I don't should be a gay studies department. I don't think there should be a woman's studies department. And this most controversially at all, I don't think there should be a Jewish studies department or a Mideast studies department. All of these departments, including the Jewish studies and the Mideast studies departments, have been rampantly anti-Zionist and in some case anti-Semitic. When you divide people in colleges and universities along these lines, when, when black students take black studies and Jewish students take Jewish studies, and women take women's studies, you're defeating the purpose of a university, which is diversity of education. So there are these three villains, um, these uh, identity politics departments, uh, intersectionality and DEI, which have taken over universities and destroyed them. My prediction, in 10 years, unless this changes, the United States universities will be way down the list of universities around the world because this is worse in the United States than it is in other Western democracies. Well, this kind of willful ignorance and identity politics brainwashing seems to be so endemic throughout the Western world now. What will it take for countries to reject this, and, and more specifically, the false perception that Israel is oppressing and waging genocide against the Palestinians, and that Hamas's terrorism is a legitimate form of resistance to it? Well, I hate to say this, but what will end uh, DEI is a few plane crashes uh, where the pilots were selected not based a few people dying on the operating table from surgeons who are unqualified. Um, there will be that, and we're already seeing it in the entertainment industry, where some of the some of the companies are backing away because putting every play on Broadway uh, involving just one ethnic group has caused a tremendous decline in in, in attendance. Um, you know, fortunately, we live in an open market society. I wrote an article which is. I think very uh, very interesting about uh, the role of Jews in America. So there are articles out there that say vanishing American Jews, Jews are disappearing. They're eight percent, nine percent at Harvard. They used to be twenty three percent. You know they're getting fewer this, fewer that, fewer the other thing. And I wrote that it misses half the point. It's absolutely true that when you have to pick people for jobs, Jews have suffered enormously. Jews no longer are picked, but Jews are doing very well in areas where they can make their own fortune, uh, where nobody has to pick them. Um, for example, in the financial area, um, it, success is dependent on how good you are at picking stocks and how good you are at mergers and acquisitions. And, and nobody is going to stop success from happening there. Uh, the same thing happened in the Soviet Union when they put uh, numerous clauses on Jews. Jews were not allowed to go to universities. So they became the best chess players, the best violinists, the best comedians, the best actors. As long as you could do it on your own, as long as we have a free market society, and thank God for capitalism, thank God for free market society, if there are no barriers to entry 
Jews, Asians will do fine. But as long as you pick people, for example, I make a prediction there will be fewer Jewish Nobel Prizes over the next 10 or 15 years, but there'll be increasing Jewish success in science and chemistries and, and all the things that Nobel Prizes are awarded for. Just, Jews just won't get the, the prizes, but they'll write the books. Now, Ultimately, if you keep Jews out of universities, if you keep them out of positions, it will also affect their ability to do good for society. And Israel is the Jew among nations. Uh, Israel is doing great when it comes to its own self-reliant enterprises. But, it, you know, Israelis don't win Nobel Prizes. Um, they don't uh, get honors. Uh, they don't succeed when other people have to pick them. If the United Nations decided things uh, Israel would be last on everybody's list. But in terms of doing things for itself, uh, uh, the, the, the great reason for anti-Semitism today is that Jews are the poster, poster people for meritocracy. And both uh, DEI, intersectionality, and these phony ethnic and identity departments are all opposed to meritocracy. They want to end bar exams. They want to end grades. They want to end any rankings, and um, that is what Jews excel at, um, and Asians excel at that. And some of the reason for the anti-Jewish and anti-Asian bigotry is that Jews represent the success of meritocracy, and meritocracy represents the failure, the failure of DEI and intersectionality. There's a kind of a strong America first current, which I mostly subscribe to, um, that's running through conservatism right now. But I don't believe that America first should mean America alone. What do you say to those conservatives who think that our support for Israel doesn't serve our interests uh, and that this war with Hamas is not our problem? Well, first of all, I don't disagree with uh, America first. Every country puts itself first. The nature of sovereignty, uh, France first, um, you know, Jordan first, uh, China first. So I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is not understanding that America benefits enormously from its um, alliance with Israel. Um, Israel and America together developed Iron Dome. They developed many, many um, um, intelligence uh, successes. Um, and, and, and the United States um, benefits from alliances with strong countries, with countries that win. And, and, and uh, uh, if I didn't think that the United States benefited uh, from its uh, alliance with Israel, you know, I would, I would uh, have, have some questions about it. But I'm convinced it does. And remember, the United States initially didn't support Israel militarily. Uh, even in 67, Israel got its ammunition and its weaponry from France, not from the United States. It's only been really since 67, when Israel was such a phenomenal success militarily that the United States uh, came on board and shared military technology with, uh, with Israel. So I think it's been a great partnership, and, uh, and both parties benefit from that partnership. You've been a lifelong Democrat voter in presidential elections, but you said recently that for the first time you might not pull the lever for a Democrat because the Biden administration threw Israel under the bus in this UN Security Council vote for a um, ceasefire resolution in Gaza. So I've got a two-part question for you. First, does that mean you would vote for Trump? And second, how would you rate Trump among U.S. presidents as a friend to Israel? Well, first, the second question first, of course, uh, after Harry Truman, perhaps, and Lyndon Johnson, um, uh, Trump has been Israel's best friend. Uh, I know because I worked with him closely. I worked with him on uh, recognizing Jerusalem, on recognizing the Golan Heights, I worked with his people on the Abraham Accords, um, I, I, and I worked with other presidents as well. And so he ranks very, very high uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, pro-Israel support. It's not Biden himself that is driving me away from the Democratic Party. It's 18 Democratic senators. It's 50 or so Democratic members of Congress, uh, particularly the squad. Uh, now we see that two of the head Democratic leaders uh, of, of the House have endorsed a bigot uh, who is running in the Bronx uh, uh, for re-election in Congress, somebody who's called uh, genocide, uh, Israel guilty of genocide. It's the Democratic Party itself 
which is moving hard left and which won't condemn the squad. And I can no longer consider myself a a Democrat. I, I will vote for whoever I think is the strongest uh, a candidate, but I no longer have a presumption in favor of of Democrats. Uh, for example, I will support anyone financially and in every other way who runs against the squad. Um, and, and there are efforts to defeat uh, Cory Bush, for example, who's an out-and-out racist, bigot, anti-Semite. And I think the same is true of other members of the squad. So I no longer have a presumption in favor of automatically voting for the Democrats. I've never voted for anybody but a Democrat since 1960 when I voted for John Kennedy for president. I voted for Bill Weld for governor. I voted for Mitt Romney for governor, uh, both Republicans. And I should have voted for Mitt Romney as president when he ran against um, Barack Obama the second time. That's the one presidential vote I wish I could withdraw and 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 revote uh, for Mitt Romney, who would have been a far better president than than Obama's second term. So I'm open. Um, um, and the difference between Jewish voters like me and Arab and Muslim voters, Arab and Muslim voters have nowhere to go. Uh, in Michigan, if they're not going to vote for uh, Biden, who are they going to vote for? They're not going to vote for Trump, obviously. Um, they're not going to vote for Bobby Kennedy, who's the strongest pro-Israel president uh, candidate running. I, on the other hand, and for example, my friends in Florida, Florida is now a state that's apparently in contention. There are, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Israel supporters and Jews in Florida who will not vote uh, for a candidate who doesn't support Israel. So we, uh, Jewish and Zionist and pro-Israel voters, we have some place to go other than the Democratic Party, whereas uh, Arabs and Muslims have nowhere to go except to stay home. So I haven't decided who I'm going to vote for, uh, but uh, I'm open for everybody. I want, I want for the first time, I want everybody to compete for my vote, to earn my vote, um, um, and to earn the vote of those who, who uh, see see uh, uh, along with me um, the same the same values and the same issues. So I'm not going to decide who I'm going to vote for until until the last minute. Think the current administration has brought U.S. Israel relations to a watershed moment? And if so, what happens in the Middle East if the Democrats take the White House for another four years? Well, I worry about it. Um, it, it, it is a watershed moment. There have been other watershed moments, obviously, in, in Israel's uh, history with the United States. This may be one of the worst. Uh, the thing that's so bad about it, it was, it was deliberately induced by Hamas. And if, if the Biden administration had stuck with Israel, if Biden had made the same speech that he did on October 8th or 9th, I forget which date it was, if he had continued to make that speech and continued to give unequivocal support to Israel, the war would be over. There'd be a termination of hostilities. Hamas will have surrendered. The hostages would have been returned. Uh, and the proof of the pudding is very clear. As soon as uh, Biden backed away from Israel, Hamas backed away from accepting a ceasefire proposal that it had tentatively accepted very, very favorable to Hamas and very unfavorable to Israel. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of convicted murderers would have been freed. Forty hostages would have been freed. and They would have gotten their ceasefire for Ramadan. Uh, but they backed away from that because they said, hey, why should we give up anything? Um, or why should we give up any hostages? We're getting everything we want from Biden without giving up anything. So I think the Biden administration is responsible for the war continuing. I think the war would have been over or been close to over at this point if the Biden administration hadn't worried about its two-state solution, namely Michigan and uh, Nevada or Michigan and Minnesota. Um, uh, domestic politics is playing too great a role in foreign policy re regarding the Middle East in this election year. Yes, I agree. One of the points you make in the book is that the October 7 attack probably sponsored by Iran has required Israel to consider its nuclear option as a last resort to assure its survival. Could you elaborate on that? Yes. If Israel is put to the choice of an Iran that has a nuclear arsenal or an Iran that could only have its, its nuclear arsenal destroyed by nuclear um, weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, Israel might have to adopt the latter course. Israel cannot existentially 
accept an Iran that has a nuclear arsenal. Iran has pledged that it will use that nuclear arsenal against the United States. Rafsanjani, the former head of the mullahs in Iran, who's supposed to be more moderate, said that Israel is a one-bomb state, and if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it will destroy Tel Aviv, killing three million Jews. Israel will then retaliate, bomb Tehran, and kill 10 million Muslims. And this is Rafsanjani speaking. The trade-off, he said, would be worth it, because it would end Israel, but Islam would still continue and Iran would still continue because there are so many more Muslims than Jews. When you have a, quote, moderate leader of your enemy making statements like that, you can't ignore them. As Elie Wiesel so perceptively put it about the Holocaust, he said, for him, the lesson was always believe the threats of your enemies more than the promises of your friends. The promises of America have not been faithfully carried out, but the threats of Israel's enemies have generally been faithfully carried out. So if there is only two horrible alternatives, uh, a nuclear armed Iran or a nuclear destroyed Iranian, uh, a nuclear facility, Israel must opt for protecting its own civilians. I hope it doesn't come to that. Israel also has more tactical ways of destroying um, Iran's nuclear facilities with the help of the United States. But if the United States won't help, Israel may have to go to it alone. But there isn't a single leader in Israel, regardless of party, who thinks that Iran should be allowed to develop a nuclear arsenal. Uh, Let me ask you one more question about your book before we shift gears a little bit, Um, because I think this is an important point. You write in the book that there should be no absolute distinction between civilians and combatants in Gaza, but instead uh, there should be what you call a continuum of civilianality. What is that? Well, it's so obvious when you think about it. Uh, There are so many different elements uh, in Gaza. There are the actual Hamas fighters. You know, they wear the green, uh, they wear uniforms. They're actual Hamas fighters. Everybody knows that they're combatants. Then there are the three-year-olds and five-year-olds and 90-year-olds. And we know they're absolute civilians. But in the middle, there's a range, 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 range of people, um, including uh, people who uh, help Uh, Hamas directly by allowing houses to be used to launch rockets and store rockets. There are those who financially aid uh, Hamas. There are those who uh, spy for Hamas, for example, the people who went to Israel and worked um, and made money and then came back and provided intelligence information to Hamas to allow them to carry out October 7th. They are certainly not uh, pure civilians, for example, a woman named Vivian Silver, who was a peace activist, and she would go to the Gaza border all the time and bring uh, sick people from Gaza to Israeli hospitals to treat them. She was then murdered, burned to death, burned alive in her own safe room, probably by very people who helped, she helped bring to hospitals. Those people are not innocent. Um, and so uh, you have a range of of civilianality, ranging from the most extreme, the three-year-olds. Take, for example, Hamas says the most people who have killed of of the the fake figure of 30-whatever thousand are women and children. But many women are combatants, and many children are combatants. Remember, the definition of a child by the Hamas health authority is anyone under 19. But we know that the vast majority of 19 and 18 and 17-year-olds there are, are, are many of them are combatants. And, um, and when, when, when they, they recruit soldiers from 13 on, and if an Israeli soldier has a 14-year-old coming at him with an RPG and he shoots him, that's ranked as killing a child. No, that's killing a child soldier, a combatant. It's a double war crime uh, by Hamas itself. And so uh, these figures are totally phony. The, 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 uh, a clear majority of people who have been killed in this war uh, in Gaza have been either direct combatants or very, very close to combat status on the uh, continuum of civilianality. The number of pure civilians killed, absolutely innocent pure civilians killed, is much, 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 much lower than the numbers given. There's no accident that the Hamas authorities when they give out figures, they don't even distinguish between combatants and 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 civilians. What they do is they just 
distinguish between women and children. It's so sexist and it's so ageist. Uh, it implies that every woman is a civilian. But of course, many, many women uh, are, are members of Hamas and are fighters with Hamas. Practically, the only thing a woman is allowed to do in Gaza today is kill Jews. Um, they're not allowed to you know, be on their own. They're not allowed to ride cars on their own, but they're allowed to kill Jews. So women are combatants and children are combatants. So don't believe these figures. Don't believe these statistics. Uh, let's shift gears a bit and address this controversy over Donald Trump's legal battles and the uh, Democrats' politicization of justice as a strategy for keeping him out of the White House. What is this kind of lawfare that we're seeing, this weaponization of the legal system? What does this mean for the future of our country? Oh, it's very dangerous. It means tit for tat. And we're already seeing it. We're already seeing Democrats, you know, are trying to impeach. Republicans are trying to impeach Democrats. Uh, if if Trump were to come to office, you can be sure there would be attempts to use the Justice Department to um, settle scores. It shouldn't happen. Um, there should be complete neutral objectivity. Uh, but there is none. Um, prosecutors now run for office on on the uh, argument of get Trump. I, I named my book Get Trump, not because I'm so creative. I borrowed the title from Letitia James. That was her campaign pledge. That was also, in effect, uh, uh, bag the DA of Manhattan's campaign pledge. If they fail to get Trump, they will not be reelected. So they have an incentive to get Trump. That's a conflict of interest. Uh, prosecutors are supposed to do justice, not politics. Even Jack Smith has acknowledged that he wants there to be a conviction before the elections to influence voters in the election. That's not the proper role of a prosecutor. And so I think we're seeing a complete politicization and weaponization of our criminal justice system uh, to favor partisans. Yeah, I think this kind of partisan politicization is uh, affecting not only the legal field, uh, law schools now, as you know, are being infected with, the, with this same agenda of social justice activism, but also the fields of journalism and education and even medicine. Can anything good come from uh, politicizing these fields that should remain neutral? Absolutely not. And they are destroying uh, the professions. They are destroying our trust in the professions. Um, you know, Today, you have to ask yourself, if you're on an airplane and there's turbulence, do I have a DEI pilot or do I have a meritocracy pilot? Uh, if you're in the emergency room of a hospital, you have to ask yourself, is my surgeon a DEI surgeon? It's bad for minorities because there are some extraordinarily well-qualified black pilots, black surgeons, but uh, people no longer have faith or trust in that because they know it's not based on meritocracy. Washington State now wants to abolish the bar exam. I think if they do, that every law firm has to notify clients, this is a lawyer who hasn't passed the bar. Um, clients, patients have a right to know. Uh, this is a doctor who was picked by DEI, not picked on the merits. Um, we have it, we're entitled to know who we are servicing us, who, are, who we're putting our life in the hands of. And these social injustice programs um, are, are not serving any good and legitimate purpose except to um, uh, create more and more and more and more. And, and there's no, no, I mean, what's the goal? The goal is to have every ethnic group represented in every profession in proportion to their numbers so that Jews will be 2% of uh, every uh, profession, except sports, by the way, except sports. Um, in sports, it could be 90% black. That's okay. And we all want that because we want meritocracy. We don't want some short point guard from Brooklyn uh, who's Jewish or Italian or Irish who can't hit to be playing for the Knicks. We want only the best players. Why should it be different in other areas of, of life? You know, it was interesting that the NAACP called for a boycott of Florida uh, by athletes because Florida is rejecting DEI. But... <laughs> ACP doesn't want DEI for sports. They want to make sure that the teams remain a meritocratic, which in athletics, particularly basketball <clears throat> and football, will mean dominantly, dominantly black. So, you know, you just can't have it both ways. And the right way to do it is to restore meritocracy to every aspect of life, every single aspect of life. Let the chips fall where they may. 
I have a belief in equality. And I believe if you have pure meritocracy and you don't put the thumb on the scale in any way, that you will get diversity naturally, not artificially, if everybody is in fact equal and they have equal opportunities. And that's my goal. That was Martin Luther King's goal. Absolutely right. One more question about Donald Trump's legal battles. Do you think there's going to be a conviction or is he going to slip through the net one more time? I think there'll be a conviction uh, in New York, probably. It's the weakest case I've seen in 60 years of practicing and teaching and writing about law, but it's New York. And in New York, uh, they will indict um, and convict a ham sandwich, or in this case, a sandwich, um, if it has the name Trump on it. So notwithstanding how weak the case is, it's very likely there'll be a conviction. Mr. Dershowitz, what is the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing and writing? Well, I write every day and I have a I have a podcast called The Dersh Show. It's on Rumble and YouTube and it's live Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday from 530 to 6 and you can get it online anytime, you know, 24 seven. I also write op eds. And um, these days I'm writing, you know, two or three books a year. I have out just this week called War on Woke, Why the New McCarthyism is More Dangerous Than the Old. I'm working on another book called, uh, basically, uh, I, haven't, I haven't figured out the exact title, but it's something like this, Palestinian Pied Pipers Are Driving Your Children from the River to the Sea, uh, Guide to Parents, because I have so many people calling me now, parents saying, what are we going to do? Our children are marching for Hamas. They have no idea where, where, where Israel is or Palestine or anything. They're just marching. Uh, so I'm trying to write a guide for parents that will give them some way of bringing their children back as their children are being stolen from them by these extremists. Fantastic. That's I'm looking forward to that. Good to know. And great hearing from you today, sir. Alan Dershowitz, thank you for coming on the Right Take podcast. Please keep up all your great work. Well, I'm going to try. I'm 85 years old. As long as the good Lord gives me the strength to fight for justice, I will try to do so. Excellent. Listeners, I highly recommend Professor Dershowitz's book, War Against the Jews. Get it wherever fine books are sold. And thank you for joining me here at the intersection of politics and culture. Don't forget to subscribe to The Right Take so you can keep up with all the important conversations we're having here. And again, if you like what you hear, please leave that positive review. Be seeing you. The Right Take with Mark Tapson is a project of the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Front Page Magazine. Unauthorized reproduction of this podcast without express written consent is prohibited.